Hello, everybody, and welcome back. I mean, we are into the third hour and the third segment of today, and uh, I'm quite starting to enjoy this, and you are all very lucky that so far I haven't pressed any wrong buttons to disconnect everybody around the world. This is a quite remarkable statement at this stage of uh, the day in my life. Um, we still, I'm told by the producers, have 300, uh, 400 people around the world. So I guess this is also a testament that we are doing well and we are addressing issues that you do care about. And that is wonderful to know that we are strong as a global professional community, not only when we are all are sitting in one room together, but just when we are connected all around the world. So, in our third segment, we will look at the second piece, very big piece of work that we as a community have in front of us after the integrated geospatial information framework. It is the future trends document. And, uh, you know, it's the third edition. Let's put it a little bit in the historical context. When the GGIM started in 2011, we started immediately uh, talking about we did not want to provide uh, solutions for right now or the tomorrow, but we wanted to look a little bit ahead in terms of at least a five to ten year um, uh, horizon and work uh, with for solutions uh, with that vision uh, in mind and we have developed the future trends uh, document very early on always was very strong UK leadership and inputs and uh, we have uh, in the middle of our journey so far in 2015-16 renewed it once and we thought it was time again the five-year horizon is a very good one to work on a third edition of the future trends and again and the UK has uh, thankfully gratefully I'm very grateful for that taken the lead in that and of course in the process I have had the pleasure of working with David Henderson who is uh, the face of the ordnance survey on that important work stream and it's my great pleasure now to introduce David uh, uh, as a speaker to introduce the strategic overview of the future trends document and then we will have again a opportunity for a few questions and as I mentioned this will be also the topic of our sessions in two weeks from now and then I will provide uh, a short wrap-up at the end of this hour and that will be it for the first day. So with that roadmap ahead of us uh, my great pleasure to give the floor to David Henderson from the Ordnance Survey. David. So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, a really warm hello from uh, a very sunny afternoon here in Southampton on the south coast of the UK. Um, thank you especially to, to those of you who are enduring either very early mornings or perhaps very late evenings um, to stay with us. We're absolutely thrilled along with the, the UN team to just have so many um, colleagues joining us uh, this afternoon for, for these sessions. Um, it's a real privilege this afternoon to be able to walk you through um, and provide a, a strategic overview of the, the future trends in geospatial information management report, um, which was open for, for consultation um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, a session like this, I, I think, would invariably work better in person. It, it naturally leads to discussion, to debate. It would be wonderful where we're able to break for coffee at the end of, of this talk. Uh, and to be able to talk about some of the, the trends and the insights which um, are, are within the report. And sadly, that part of, uh, of this afternoon just is not possible. Um, however, I guess this afternoon is about setting some, um, to give you a bit of insight to, to the work behind the report uh, and perhaps to tease you with some homework um, ahead of two weeks time and to entice you to, to read certain parts of the report uh, before we have a, a deeper session on this together. Um, in two weeks time. Um, as Greg said earlier, I'm also acutely um, conscious of the fact that some of the, the colleagues on, on, on today's call will be very aware of the, the previous iterations um, of the report and um, indeed will have participated in the creation of the first edition, uh, the second edition and now the third edition. Others may not be so familiar um, at all and this therefore 
may serve to be a, an introduction to the report. And, and I guess I'll try to talk um, to both audiences a bit um, this afternoon as we go through it. Uh, I'd also like just to start with, um, with an acknowledgement uh, and a thanks up front. Um, this report has only been made possible um, by the extraordinary leadership of, of one of my colleagues, uh, Kristen Waters, who's acted as our, as our editor in chief, our, our primary author in bringing all of these insights together. Um, and I hope you're able to share my congratulations to Kristen for, for a work um, that's been really well done. And also on behalf of everybody um, in, in the Ordnance Survey and UK team who's contributed, I'd just really like to thank the, the Secretariat and the team in New York uh, for their support and their leadership in, in, in taking the work forward. Um, so just to really start off, what, what is the Future Trends Report? Well, strategic insights are an essential component of long-term planning, whether it's in business, whether it's in policy. And I think for the committee of experts, it's always been helpful for us to have a, a longer term view on those future trends and the impact on geospatial information management, a five to 10 year vision um, has proven to be a useful reference frame um, for the work that, that, that we've collectively undertaken. The two previous reports have been considered an important output for the Committee of Experts and provided a consensus view for the professional geospatial community to keep abreast of, of new trends in geospatial information, particularly with the impact um, that these technologies are placing um, on our industry. The third edition, the, the most recent report, um, prepared through a global consensus process, is intended to complement the integrated geospatial information framework. And I'll, I'll note that towards the, the end of this talk. But helping to ensure that the framework integrates and takes advantage of the latest innovation and trends. We've launched the report virtually over the last month. We had hoped to have done so face to face in London, as you know. Um, and over the next few weeks, we'd invite you to make comment, final comment um, on, on the report so that we can present it to the Committee of Experts um, for adoption at its 10th session later this year. So I'm going to start this talk really with a bit of a, an overview of the factors that lie behind um, the report, the drivers, the trends, the responses that we've seen um, and captured from across the, um, across the industry and um, those trends that are impacting on the way the, the industry is developing. I'll then talk a little bit about the report itself and, and try and explore the structure of the report and the way in which we hope it will be um, used and, and, and valued by us all um, over the coming time. Um, and hopefully just tease you um, into uh, participating in the, the further workshop in two weeks time uh, where we'll go into uh, the conclusions in, in, in much more detail. So by way of setting the scene, the, the geospatial industry is affected by a variety of influences that, that determine how and in what direction the industry is most likely to develop. The report tries to place trends in the context of a number of wider macro trends that appear consistent to all nations in terms of topical interest. Climate change and associated environmental uh, pressures, population change and a shift in citizen values and attitudes, not least those associated with urbanization, political readiness, especially those that relate perhaps to geopolitical implications, economic outlooks, whilst already slowing, the current projections are being rewritten in the context of the COVID-19 global pandemic. And of course, more generally, technological advancement, which continues to move at pace. Since the publication of the last Future Terrains report, a significant <laughs> increase in the use of geospatial information and technologies has been observed across a variety of sectors, especially the health sector. Topical at the moment, geographic information plays an important role in the framework for Public Health Emergency Operations Centre as published by the World Health Organization. As such, geospatial data and technologies are seen as the backbones of the response and the recovery from emergency incidences, but also part of the process for spatial risk assessments. Even before the unprecedented global events of 2020 started to evolve, emergency incidents such as the Ebola outbreak in Western, Western Africa had significantly promoted large-scale projects aiming to improve the availability, the quality and the accessibility of geospatial data in support of sustainable development. Sanjay gave a great overview earlier this afternoon, um, this morning or this evening, depending where you are, 
a great overview of the global response as to how the geospatial industry and the geospatial sector has supported um, the, the, the response to COVID-19 in the last few months. This year, we have witnessed a revolution in the way in which geospatial data has been used to track, to analyze, to predict, to respond, to communicate in, in support of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. We have seen the rapid emergency of, emergence rather, of platforms and tools being made available at global, at national, at local level, supporting communities in their fight against COVID-19. Colleagues across the public sector, the private sector, amongst third sector agencies, have been working closely together to tackle a common problem. And right now, it's hard to imagine that the very positive behavioral responses, collaboration, sharing of resources and expertise, data improvements, and an eye on the bigger picture are likely to wane anytime soon. To me, these seem fundamentally powerful ingredients necessary to deliver on the UN Sustainable Development Goals and, and those that lie ahead of us in the next 10 years. Now, I just leave one quote with you at this early stage of the presentations that we included in the report this time round. It comes from Bill Gates in his book, The Road Ahead, when he said, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years, but underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. And I think whilst the timescales may be subject to some debate, that was a quote from the 1990s, the sentiment, I think, is just as true today. And I think, you know, we should be very alive as a community to not underestimating the change that will occur to our industry as a result of the trends that are presented in the Future Trends Report over probably the next two to three years, never mind the next 10. For the past three decades, Digital data has become the basis on which governments, organisations and businesses base their decisions. And over the last 10 years, we as a community have witnessed the advent of far greater location enablement in that data. Today, the volume, the size, the speed, the diversity, the complexity in which geospatial data is generated requires changes to the processes currently used and requires a workforce capable of searching, analysing, and managing these large amounts of data. I just wanted to pause for a few moments and reflect, I guess, on why we ought to have a close eye on the strategic um, developments, the innovations which are impacting now on our industry and how they are influencing the wider value that geospatial technologies will continue to make. Technology, of course, continues to play an important role in disrupting the geospatial industry. Ranging from further automation to the Internet of Things, big data, artificial intelligence, immersive technology and the rise of digital twins. Private sector and national agencies alike are impacted by this unprecedented level of disruption. Among the variety of technological trends, there is a general consensus across the industry that automation, artificial intelligence and connectivity through 5G will have the greatest disruptive impact over the short to medium term. Geospatial data, geospatial information has become a ubiquitous part of everyday services and is central to the business models of many of the digital disruptors that have become prominent since we wrote the first edition of this report back in 2011 to 2013. The rise of the smartphone and tablets have greatly contributed to people's expectation about the usage of geospatial applications. User demand for increasing accuracy, currency and detail continues to grow and will require more automated data capture and feature extraction to keep pace with those requirements. Technological developments, the nature of the machine-led decision-making in autonomous mobility and other applications that will require multi-stakeholder partnerships to cr create themselves new challenges in a world that will increasingly be managed virtually. In the context of trends, cybersecurity, data privacy, ethics, trust and licensing will nonetheless increase in relevance as an interdisciplinary collaboration are now at the forefront. Of course, government-led geospatial infrastructures will need to take account of and consider responses to these emerging top trends through an increased uh, look at some of the legal and policy frameworks. The next five to 10 years will see significant developments in the maturity and application of already well-established technologies across our industry. Among others, artificial intelligence, sensor technology, and the internet of things will drastically change the way in which data is collected, managed, and maintained. 
developed nations, developing nations and small island developing states alike will reap the benefits of more affordable drone and satellite technologies equipped with image classification capabilities as valid alternative data sources. The use of technology and analytical methods have the potential to reduce the geospatial digital divide over the decade to come. So hopefully that provides an overview, I guess, of just some of the, the macro factors and, and, and the, the impact of some of the change um, which we are faced with over the num next number of years. In 2011, at the first session of the Committee of Experts that Stefan introduced, the committee felt that there was a need to document the thoughts of our leaders across the industry as to the future um, trends and insights that we should be taking most attention to um, as, we, as we conducted our work and our deliberations. We updated the first edition around about 2016 um, when the, the second edition of the Future Trends Report um, was adopted by the, the Committee of Experts. And at its eighth session in 2018, the Committee of Experts invited to, to undertake a third review in order to stay um, very well informed by the, 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 the rapidly developing external environment in which we worked. The third edition of the report has been authored on behalf of the United Nations Committee of Experts by Ordnance Survey, um, the, the, the mapping agency in Great Britain. However, the content is entirely based on the first and second editions, contributions received in writing from a wide range of industry experts and interested groups, and the views expressed during the very many discussions that we held with a large um, cross-section of, of this community um, in June and August last year. The content does not necessarily reflect the views of the author. And I guess there's a, a disclaimer around the debate, which will no doubt follow um, some of the, the commentary in the report. While different and at times conflicting, consensus has generally been reached on a number of major trends and important themes that we were able to summarize have, however, been forthcoming. As I say, this feels from our perspective as a truly global collaborative effort, and it's one from which the Ordnance Survey team would like to thank everybody who has participated so willingly. So many people have been very gracious and generous in, in sharing their insights, their experience with us in, in writing, by sharing documents, and indeed face-to-face -face when we were able to do so last year um, in a range of different consultation environments where we gathered around flip charts um, and we're able to, to, to draw on a whiteboard together. Some of you will remember um, positioning some of the trends um, on, a, on a matrix um, when we were together at that time. So thank you to everybody who has participated in this. And we hope that you're able to see the contribution that you made in, in the report um, as has been published. Now, I just thought I'd reflect um, a little bit on the report itself, just to provide some structure and some, some narrative about how perhaps we envisage um, colleagues using the report. So it's broad in nature. Um, looking at emerging trends in technological, legal policy, skills and training, different views on the private, non-governmental sectors, and indeed the role of government. The first chapter of the report provides a high-level analysis, which, which I'll, I'll summarise in just one moment, um, as to the top global drivers and, and trends that are predicted to have the greatest impact over the next five to ten years. The following chapters go into a little bit more detail on the trends that were provided in the previous two editions and continues the narrative through to 2020 and beyond um, into the next few years. Each chapter contains a, a, an executive summary at the top, just capturing the key highlights that we've tried to draw into, draw, it, uh, draw into there. And hopefully those highlights themselves provide a useful executive summary as you work through the document. Now, in terms of um, the document itself, what does the report say? Well, there are five broad trends which feel to us as authors to have emerged as, as worthy of being drawn out and commented on specifically. These are, these are trends, these are, are themes, if you like, which are most significant um, to us in terms of, um, of, of reporting on on the trends and giving some context and some framing uh, for the report. 
Firstly, in terms of an industrial structural shift, I think we've all experienced the significant disruptive change that has occurred in terms of map generation technologies, use cases, business models, and user requirements over the last few years. We observe that expertise in consolidating large numbers of data sets, understanding of mapping requirements, using data for applications for which that data wasn't originally um, collected and envisaged to be used, and developing new tool sets for automated map creation will be critical for the future. Driven by the automotive industry and telecommunications, high definition maps are crucial for the self-driving industry. Consequently, the automotive industry has been identified as one of the future markets of choice for many geospatial businesses that are offering data and solutions going forward. In terms of skill sets, automation and artificial intelligence applications will enable employees to be freed up from predominantly data capture tasks to focus on higher value applications associated, associated with the delivery of information platforms and undertaking geospatial analyses. In terms of user requirements, the internet, mobile devices, and the growing number of location-based services means that an increasing number of users have constant and direct contact with geospatial information. Demand for, for near real-time data is driven by the expectation of instant and frictionless access to information on mobile devices. City, municipalities, urban areas have emerged as a highly engaged user of geospatial information, particularly since the rise of smart city solutions and digital twin technologies. Early examples of digital, uh, of digital representations of city infrastructure as digital twins have enabled city areas to monitor and simulate scenarios related to climate change and flooding events while mitigating risks and increasing infrastructure resilience. Of course, the legislative environment, the aspects of our policy environments and our legal considerations continue to be really important. The increasing number of connected devices and data volumes have also started to raise questions around data privacy and cybersecurity that will need to continue to be addressed. Of course, some of these technologies continue to move quicker at pace than our ability to put in place the legislation and the regulation needed to work with them. All the more important that as a community, we're able to be discussing these. So I guess, especially in terms of security of personal information, this has led to calls to tighten data privacy regulations and data ethics frameworks. National government and international institutions alike have created guidelines on when using geospatial data and technology and how to consider the ethical aspects of that data. Technological advancement continues to move at pace. Predominantly driven by automation, as I say, artificial intelligence, sensor technologies, and the Internet of Things, advances in technologies such as high performance cloud computing, ubiquitous high speed connectivity, new sensor networks and sensor platforms, analytics, and autonomous smart machines have created a shift towards a more machine centric world. And we see lots of examples of that that are explored in more detail in the report. And I'd specifically mention there that although quantum computing is still in the early stages of its de development relatively, the geospatial industry experts anticipate the technology to have a great impact on intensive processing over the next few years. And just finally, I think it's worth really specifically identifying the rise of new data sources and analytical methods. Mobile data collection, crowdsourcing, social media are likely to have the greatest impact on the availability of new data sources over the coming de decade. These forms of data collection will enable accurate, near real-time applications that are increasingly demanded by various users of geospatial data. Alongside that, the availability of low-cost, high-quality, high-frequency Earth observation satellite data has contributed to the ever-increasing volumes of data that are now available to us. Combined with artificial intelligence and computational capabilities, developed and developing nations will witness productivity increases in processes of data creation, data maintenance, and data management. I won't dwell on this slide particularly. Sanjay um, did a really great job earlier on of just talking about the contributions that we've seen made um, in our response collectively to the coronavirus outbreak. But I think it's just really interesting to see the different responses that our industry has made 
and perhaps just reflect on whether it would have been possible for us to make those same responses just three or four years ago when the second edition of this report was published. I'm not so sure. Spatial big data, such as from smartphones, social media, wearable devices, being able to trace people's movements, predictions on people's behavior, and being able to use technologies and trackers and sensors to help um, contextualize the data um, that, that has been collected in, in almost real time. Visualizations and visualization platforms to communicate that information, as I said earlier on, at national, um, regional, local level, and indeed some of the global communications that we've seen shared. And of course, machine learning techniques using sensor-based te technology to really help us understand how environmental changes may impact upon infectious disease transmission. These are all very, very timely to the current moment. Now, just um, in, the in the last few slides, really, I just wanted to draw attention to a number of important diagrams that we've included within the report. Um, they don't translate so well onto just one part of a, of a slide, as, as will be obvious for those of you um, looking at the slides on screen just now. Um, but I'd encourage you to look at those, um, those graphics, which were shared as part of the consultation in higher resolution and, and are also available within the report document themselves. And they're useful structural diagrams that we hope give some context and hope allow you to work through the report um, with, a, with a degree of um, structure around that. We've really noticed that in the last few years, there's an explicit recognition of data and data technologies emerging, not at the expense of, but certainly much in addition to the more explicit technology-based or technological changes that we saw in the first two editions. The explicit recognition of data at the expense of technology is something that is very, very strongly recognized. User requirements are increasingly at the forefront. Technology and, and data are no longer the barrier to us responding to those user requirements. And partnerships and collaborations um, are now commonplace and much, much more prominent than perhaps they, they were previously. Of course, some of the things which remain, remain the same and remain very dominant around policy and legal frameworks, um, acceptance that much technology innovation drives disruption, and I'll come on to that in a second. And just to really emphasize the significance of government and government policies um, shaping and helping to contribute to the positive shaping of our geospatial industry going forward, they remain very true. I said before about innovation and disruption. I think what's really interesting is when you start to break down the very many innovations which are so present um, across our industry and, and those areas which are impacting on them, some of which are shared on this slide. I think what's really interesting is when so many of those innovations come together to create significant disruption. And I think every year that goes by now, we see brand new opportunities emerging from, from potential that we hadn't previously envisaged. It's not coming from one particular innovation, but multiple innovations coming together to create opportunities which are genuinely disruptive in the way in which we work with geospatial technologies. And that's something which we should continue to look out for um, going forward. So in terms of drivers and trends, the information received through this consultation um, have really helped us identify the top trends. We're going to spend more time in two weeks' time really drilling into both the technology-based trends and also the more policy uh, and framework-related aspects of that. And I'd really encourage you to, to perhaps dive, dive into the report ahead of that session and, 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 and have a think about the questions which are of most interest to you in so doing. A final attempt, and hopefully something which uh, will be familiar to those of you who took part in the workshops last year, um, we, we, we tried to classify um, all of the various trends which, we, um, which we'd written up in, in the report and talk about them in the, in the context of their, their predictability, their, their, the likelihood of those having um, an impact in, in the medium and long-term trajectory, so the predictability alongside the specific impact that any of those would have. And, and I accept that you know, we, we, we led the jury a little bit by only really talking about those trends that we, we saw in the top right-hand corner um, of, this, um, of this graph. But nonetheless, you can see some of those um, technologies in particular, 
um, some of those new data sources and analytical methods really pushing into the, the, the very high predictability and the very significant impact um, that we expect to, to see present. And we've included that work within the report for you to look at. And then just finally, um, we said earlier on that we feel that the report is a really useful companion to the introduction of the integrated framework and the strategic pathways uh, which have been introduced in the implementation grade that, uh, that Greg walked us through earlier on this afternoon. We've tried to, to relate the key trends which are presented in this edition of the Future Trends Report and set those in the context of the pathways to which they are, they, they are most uh, relevant. Um, innovation will impact upon all of the different strategic pathways, but it is clear that some of those trends, be them technological, related to data, or indeed related to the environment, the policy environment, and the emerging macro trends, will impact on some pathways more than others. And we hope that as we get into action planning um, and taking the next steps forward with the integrated framework, this table is a useful way to dive into the future trends report and to draw out some of those considerations um, which will underpin um, the, the, the good work that will go into that action planning. So really just to, to summarize, uh, we're in a period of global consultation. We've initiated a broad global consultation on the Future Trends Report, the third edition. That is out for consultation now, and the Secretariat would welcome comments no later than the 26th of June, so over the next four to five weeks. We will also go into more detail on the trends themselves and some really great presentations as to how some of these trends are impacting on, on mainstream industry in two weeks time when we get back together on the 9th of June. And so really with that, um, I'll hand back to, to Stefan, um, who I believe is uh, collecting any questions which come in. Uh, we can explore the more detailed questions in two weeks time. I would love to be going to a coffee break right now with everyone. Um, I know there is much to talk about um, in terms of the trends that have been presented a little bit this afternoon and those that are in their reports. Um, but with that, back to you, um, Stefan. I look forward to talking to you all again further another time. Thank you. Thank you very much. My notes here say thank David. So, and as I'm a dutiful international bureaucrat, I will do exactly as I was instructed here. And I do that very happily and for quite a number of things uh, for your excellent presentation, for leading us into the future, so to speak. You do realize that as of now, you will be globally recognized as Mr. Future Trends. So you have to, we will give you an email address to everybody who has any questions about the next five years or so. Um, thank you also for sharing the sunshine of where you are and thank you and your team of course for all the incredible work I know that you've been putting in uh, with our team and many long late night uh, discussions on how we can make the best of the year-long preparation that our two teams have made for this virtual event. Okay, I have a cup captured a few more questions here and it's I mean they keep coming in and that's a good thing um, I think we are now by four over 60 questions let me just perhaps summarize a little bit I mean there are questions very specific lots of some of them are not questions but uh, positive comments and I'm grateful for those too uh, people are enjoying the event so this is in this slightly impersonal new world that I don't see you uh, a nice feedback to get um, there are people talking about the importance of place names the importance of leadership uh, the you are making so many suggestions what the UN role could be so that that is helpful even though that may not come up as a question we will study this I promise you carefully internally and that will be helping to guide not only the next seminars but also our future work so so please keep those coming but now to a specific two three question for David just to torture you a little bit um, there is one from our dear friend Fraser who said now it's been 10 years since the first report uh, I guess when we started looking at the third report, we were looking back at the first two and some of our earlier projections. Now, as you've been in this work, uh, Steve, uh, how are we doing so far? 
in in uh, if, how did our first two reports live up to the expectations uh, that we had then and and how is the third even better than those two thank you um stefan i look that that is a um a simple question to ask and, and one that is much more challenging to to answer i suspect i, th I think in the main and um, by the nature of the report um there there are many trends that continue forward um, I, I think one of the reasons why we included the, the, the quote from Bill Gates is in many respects to, to point to the fact that, you know, whilst we perhaps thought in the early stages that some trends would present themselves much more quickly, um, they, they perhaps haven't had the immediate impact that we thought they would. Um, there are other trends, however, which have come much more quickly. I mean, I, I think from, from my perspective, the, the increasing... Um, way in which uh, mobile platforms, mobile data sources, um, the, 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 the consideration of the individual as a sensor in their own right um, have come forward much quicker than, than we could possibly have imagined. And that seems actually strange talking about that in the year 2020. Um, but thinking back to, to 2013 even, um, I'm not sure we would have appreciated just how significant um, the the advent of mobile technologies we'd have on our, on our on our industry. I think the the other thing which perhaps isn't so much a uh, something which has surprised us looking back to the first one, but that I think is worthy of note today, and I, I mentioned it um, towards the end of that talk, was the shift from from seeing future trends at a technology level being about technology and the movement of that to being about data. And I think some of the, the technologies which initially were about the technology itself has become about the relevance of that technology to data, both in terms of data collection, data interrogation, and the fact that indeed you can go from sensor to, um, to, to management, to analysis, to presentation, and a human has not participated, if you like, in a, in a traditional sense. So the machine um, led uh, collection and dissemination of data is something which I think is is, is really notable in, in this latest trend. I, th I think just maybe finally that the, the broader aspects away from technology I think have endured the, the recognition of the role of government and the recognition of the importance of regulation um, of policy um, of, of, of the drive of government and government's collective investment um, is 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 really important to draw out, um, and and I think they we did see those right. Um, I think we continue to reiterate the importance of those. Indeed, the the importance of this community and the collaborations we have to ensure that these matters are picked up and discussed um, and, and 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 demonstrated um, through the the committee of experts is, is is really important. But I think it's just worth noting that each report. Is, is intended to build on the one before. So there is no step change, if you like, between each. And you know, I think that there is continuity. And so picking up the third one, it should be possible to see the advent of those trends um, through the last seven or eight years as, as we've seen them evolve. Um, thank you very much. I think you, you already touched on what I was going to bring as the next question because a number of uh, uh, uh people are touching on that data privacy issues and uh, i mean i mean the as what you mentioned the rapid uh, um development of iat and the great possibilities that we have um and a little bit the superman principle with great uh, powers come great responsibilities um so not everything we can do nowadays should be done obviously so that 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 the tension between privacy protection um, and uh, and the role of government and uh, and public use of the data um, is is come up in a number of questions here, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity to comment on it, or perhaps also from your national perspective, you are responsible for uh, a big and important country that has been a leader in many respects, whether you've had some specific experiences that you would like to share in this context. Yeah, I think maybe just two quick comments, um, uh, Stefan, in regard to that. I think national geospatial policy um, is really important. There was a question asked of Greg um, around SDI versus um, integrated framework. And I think 
I heard in, in Greg's response an acknowledgement of the importance of geospatial policy um, within government. And here in the UK, it was, it was great that Talia was able to join us at the start of this afternoon um, to draw attention to the UK government's uh, work in ensuring that um, geospatial policy is developed at the heart of UK government um, going forward. And I, and I observed similar initiatives like that happening um, in other parts of the world. And I think that's a really important contribution to ensure that we do have the right policy environment for in, in order to achieve the outcomes that, that we collectively seek. I think you, you also mentioned there are aspects of trust and ethics and some of the, 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 the really challenging aspects, I guess, of, of how technology interacts with our everyday life. Um, both in the US and, and here in the UK, we've been taking forward initiatives over the last 18 months, um, you know, often with, with donor support and funding, for which we're certainly grateful. Um, it, um, in the UK, we have a, uh, an innovation centre, um, which, which Ordnance Survey works with, that many people will be familiar with, called Geovation. And uh, through the Geovation uh, environment, we've been progressing with an initiative called Benchmark, um, over the last 12 months, which has really sought to, to explore um, aspects of, of ethics and trust and data and to really start to help shape the future policy environments necessary that we can leverage the value of that data without at the same time um, undermining some of the principles um, that we think are appropriate in the way in which data, especially data around citizens, um, are, are protected and indeed exploited. And we've seen much of that um, take place globally through, through the recent coronavirus um, pandemic as we, as we really challenge to use health data and data that's the, possibly the most sensitive data to us as individuals that use that in a strategic planning process. So I, I'd love to talk more about Benchmark in, in due course, Stefan, um, but I think there are some really great um, initiatives which are beginning to, to shape that environment going forward and we'll report on that further I'm sure. Well thank you very much David I think uh, for this uh, broad panorama and uh, I mean for uh, you were quite honest at the very beginning of your malicious intention is to tease everybody and uh, and get their appetite for the event in two weeks so we do not want to answer all of your questions but because we want you to come back in two weeks when we will have a full session on on this topic and i'm sure uh, david will be on on the hook again and uh, all of those questions we will we will share them with him and then he can and we can uh, fine-tune our presentations there and then so we've been we are approaching we are one minute away from the three hour mark we started on time so i want to do a short wrap-up session and really thank everybody around the world that you were sticking with us and there were large numbers uh, for this three-hour session uh, either in the early morning or in the middle of your day or perhaps even late at night uh, congratulations for three hours of geospatial information management that is um, that is quite remarkable I really also want to thank all of my partners who've made this happen. Of course, uh, in particular, our uh, hosting partners in the UK, uh, Ordnance Survey, the senior leadership, uh, Steve and David and Talia. And then, of course, all the uh, presenters that we had, Rosamund, Oliver, uh, Sanjay. And then, of course, also last but not least, my own team with Greg at the head, with whom, without whom this all would not have been possible. Um, I think this was very, very good. And I also want to thank the team uh, behind the scenes. I mean, Bruce and his life group, uh, because I mean, in order for us to be able to connect, uh, somebody has to press all the right buttons and prevent me from, pr from pressing the wrong ones. So I will not make a long summary, but just a few points that uh, I think I'm, 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 I, I'm really pleased about. I think we at the United Nations are primarily trying to bring people together. I said that earlier, and I think this event 
has done this again. We are creating communities around the world and, uh, and sometimes across sectors and chapters. And this has been happening today. And I think your interest is testimony to that, that we are reaching uh, uh, your minds and your hearts and talking to your concerns. Even your critical uh, uh, comments, some of them that are reflected in the questions are very, very welcome because they help us to keep a reality check and make sure that all what we are doing is equally valuable for whether you're sitting in a developed country or in a developed country, developing country, whether you're sitting in a big country or in a small country, whether you sit in the global north or in the global south. So our job is uh, to keep it all together and create uh, communication. And I think we have successfully done this. And I hope we will take this much further. Um, one of the snippets I liked most is uh, in connection with the IGIF is it, it creates a, a community of practice. Now people who are working on this at the country level, they have some other friends and colleagues to call in other countries and figure out how they have done it and, and share practical experiences. And I believe that's exactly what the United Nations is all about when we get to that point. Um, as Steve said it at the very b beginning, we have uh, uh, common problems, but we need to answer them with shared solutions. And that is even more important in this critical and uh, um, crisis environment uh, that, that we are in right now. And I'll share with you a little secret. I'm very proud of our professional communities because I honestly think that we here down in the trenches and when it is about real things we are doing a much better job to work together as a planet and globally and helping each other across borders than our big politicians i think they can sometimes take a cue from us how they could perhaps better work together to to solve global crises but before i lose my job because i say something i shouldn't be saying publicly I want to thank you all and just emphasize again, there's never an end with us. I mean, these are all ongoing processes. Um, two import, one important date, two important processes. There are these global consultations on both the integrated uh, geospatial information framework and the future trends document. And we have just extended the deadline to the 26th of June. So if you want to study these documents, if you want to contribute to these documents, if you have strong opinions, please look at these documents. They are on our website and you can give us comments and this is how we work and we will take everything very, very seriously and it will become part of the package that will then be adopted formally through our UN processes when we meet again in the UN GGIM uh, 10 format. Now, I already indicated earlier to you, some of you have heard this already. Unfortunately, given the current situation, we will not be able to physically meet in early August in New York as we have done for the last 10 years. Uh, but we are looking and working with our Economic and Social Council and our partners in the IT department on what we can do not to lose the momentum. And the current proposal is to have uh, three uh, web virtual connections for the GGIN 10 meeting towards the end of August and the beginning of the September. So the concrete decision, and this will be communicated very, very soon, so please stay tuned so unfortunately we could not see you in london this year unfortunately we cannot host you this year in new york but this is only a ripple in the much larger uh, flow of things i can promise you next year 2021 we'll have a big uh, 10-year anniversary ggim party in new york in august and i'm already looking forward to having everybody of you around the table there. So thank you to everybody who made this happen, who participated in it. And as you know, we have two more events. If you really like this, come back next Tuesday and the Tuesday afterwards uh, for the second and third day of this virtual high-level forum. I can promise or also you don't have to deal with me, then there will be really competent people who will be in charge and lead you through those uh, um, uh, perhaps slightly more technical days. So thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Have a good afternoon. Have a good evening or night, wherever you are. And thank you for being together in this moment.